My name is Connor, and I'm going to be sharing a bit tonight along with our wonderful Judy Orid. Can we give Judy a, a big shout? Praise God. We've got Judy in the house. If you've never met Judy before, she's a legend. Uh, she has been a part of YWAM for so many years and has been um, just a faithful pillar in this, uh, this YWAM like movement. She has brought about encouragement, dynamic teaching, challenge. If, like, if you can think about it, Judy's probably done it. Praise God. And we have the honor of, of hearing her tonight. But she has self-proclaimed that she is the queen of brief. Um, so she invited me to come and yap for a little bit to fill some space. No, I'm just kidding. That's not why. But, uh, but she invited me to lay some groundwork to prepare the way for, for what she has tonight. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, Thursday night gathering is what we're at tonight. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we are looking at some of the cultures of the kingdom this quarter. It was one of the things that we felt in prayer as an organization team. And um, this is our sort of time as a YWAM Harpenden community. And that means staff, that means trainees, that means people who are here for seminars. If you are here at the moment, you are a part of this community, you are welcomed. And I encourage you to throw yourself in head first. Uh, but it's also a time for us to extend our arms to welcome in people from the outside, to people to, to come together and, and get a glimpse of, of who we are, but also for us to try our best to bless others and to serve them with, uh, obviously, as we've just had some incredible times of worship, some teaching. Um, and this quarter, uh, as it just started last week, we're looking at the cultures of the kingdom of God. And last week, we had Zach Nash, and he came, and um, he talked about the culture of celebration and welcome, particularly around God's disruptions. And it was such a good word. If you were here last week, can you just raise your hand? Wonderful. So many people here. Can you keep your hand raised if you felt like that was a timely word for our community or for yourself? Susie Peachy, she loves it. She loved last week's word. Praise God. And it was such a timely time um, together, a timely word together as we gathered. And um, he walked us through kind of the historical biblical moments where God disrupted his people and how they responded, and, and what that looked like for their lives, and what that looked like for their communities, for their nation in those moments. And he, he shared about how when God breaks into a community, when he breaks into a nation, when he breaks into an individual's life, it almost always costs them something. It almost always costs them some bit of comfort, some bit of a reputation. They have to lay something down in order to be welcoming to God's disruption. God almost always enters in on his terms instead of ours, right? And the challenge for us last week, for every single one of us, whether you're staff, trainee, guest, was would you welcome, would you celebrate God's disruptions in your life? Would you celebrate when God wants to break in in an unexpected way? And tonight we're going to be talking, uh, which something that might seem a bit different, we're going to be talking about a culture of hospitality and a, a culture of generosity. But I actually feel like it's quite strategic how the Lord lined us up with disruption and hospitality because it's good, it's good, but hospitality oftentimes also comes at a cost. And hospitality also sometimes comes with a bit of a disruption. And it's a beautiful disruption. But, it, but they, they're kind of like hand in hand. And I think especially for us as a YWAM community, as a youth with a mission community, we have an emphasis on young people. And young people, I'm getting up there. You know, I'm like, Andreas Nordley came a couple years ago and he was like, raise your hand if you're over 25. And I was 25 at the time. And I was like, yeah, me. And he's like, you're old. And I was like, oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> and uh, young people, they often come with a disruption, right? And if we are to be a community of people that is hospitable to young people, especially, we need to be open 
to that disruption. So tonight we're going to be talking about hospitality, and I do feel like it's timely that it's coming off the back of last week's word about disruption. Um, But I just want to give a little bit of like a preface before I jump into it. I'm going to be hopefully quite brief. Uh, Again, hopefully is the the key word there. Um, But I'm going to give just a little bit of a preface because I just want to differentiate that hospitality and entertainment are not the same. Like, I feel like we often hear like, oh, I love having people in my home just because I I love entertaining, you know? I'm an extrovert. It's part of my personality. I love entertaining. And for my wife and I, I do love entertaining. You know, I am the extrovert. I love having people over in our our flat, having games, having dinner, having drinks. It's like the best thing. Like, I love it. But it's not the same as entertaining. Hospitality and, and entertainment, they're not the same thing. And we've got, a, we've got a quorum over here who are in the middle of a hospitality seminar. They've been here for the last, like, maybe 10 days, you know, something like that. Raise your hand if you're a part of the hospitality seminar. Yes. Amazing. They are also to blame for this wonderful uh, banquet that we have that we'll get to participate with soon, and we'll give them another thank you for that. But I'm like, they have got all sorts of like nuggets that they're filling their pockets with of like just gems on on hospitality nuggets that they're filling their pockets with uh, about hospitality. So I'm sure any one of them could come up here and teach something far better than me because they're just like being like enriched by it day in and day out. But it's not the same as entertainment. It's not limited to just hosting a meal in your home, but actually hospitality is a spirit in which we're all called to walk in, especially if you call yourself a follower of Jesus. Hospitality is a spirit in which we are all called to walk in, walk in a hospitable and a generous spirit. And just as a sort of like warm up for Judy, I just felt like God put on my heart um, to share just briefly two heart postures that are the foundation for Christian hospitality. Just two heart postures that are the foundation for Christian hospitality. All right, and we're going to jump into the first one. The first heart posture for Christian hospitality is, I have been brought in by God. The first heart posture for Christian hospitality is, I have been brought in by God. This is the first and most basic truth. All Christian generosity, all Christian hospitality, it rests on this truth. It's the, it's the freely I have received, therefore freely I will give kind of mentality. I have been brought in by God, and therefore, my spirit is generous. My spirit is hospitable. I can host others warmly, whether it's for a moment or it's for, you know, an extended period of time. I have been brought in by God, and therefore, I can have a hospitable spirit which hosts others well. And there's so much biblical imagery about God's invitation, God's generosity, God's hospitality towards us. You know, the prophets, you know, you go all throughout the prophets, they speak to the nation of Israel about how God is going to gather them to himself and draw them near to him, whether it's in the midst of their, you know, unfortunate circumstances or whether it's a prophecy of hope. God is saying, I will draw you near to me. I will gather you in to me because you're my children. Whether it's the psalmist saying that God is a refuge and a place of shelter, like in a moment of need, or as we were just singing, that he's a shepherd who leads us to wonderful places of rest, and he prepares a table before us, which Judy's going to talk about in a bit. Or if it's Jesus himself who's telling stories and giving teachings about wedding feasts and celebrations, let alone all that he's demonstrating by being with the marginalized. Jesus was the best at practicing hospitality without having a home. How great is that? Like, what a paradigm shift. You know, for all you singles here at YOM Harpenden who, like, are on your DTS and you just have, like, the number nine lounge or you're, like, in your shared flat somewhere and you're like, oh, no, I don't have to practice hospitality. Like, oh, no, 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 not so fast. Jesus, the son of man who had no place to lay his head, he practiced hospitality. What a radical thing. He was a hospitable guest wherever he went. Wild. Or whether it's the Apostle John seeing visions of this beautiful, decorative, lavish city that's being prepared for us. 
pristine and perfect to which one day will be brought into as a, as a pure and a holy bride. Like God is a hospitable God. God is a God who has a generous spirit who wants to bring us in and prepare a place for us. And it's because we've been brought in that we walk in that generous and hospitable spirit. It's never as clear as in uh, Jesus' story in Luke chapter 15. And he's likening the kingdom of God to this. And he talks about a son who goes up to his father and essentially says, I wish you were dead. Can I have all the money that I would get when that happens? And God's like, sure, boss, go for it. And he gives him his inheritance. And this son, he runs off and he wastes it all on everything that would bring dishonor and shame to your family to spend your money on this son. He wastes it all on that. And as he's there, like just saturated in his shame, broken, he's like, man, I had it pretty good after all at my dad's house. In fact, even those servants at my father's house, they even had it better than me. Maybe I should just go ahead and prepare this like speech of, you know, like, oh, father, I'm so sorry. And maybe I should just go and beg to be welcomed back in as a servant. And he thinks this is a pretty good plan. He's like, all right, I'm going to go do this. And if I'm fortunate enough, I'll end up a servant in my father's house. And so he makes the long journey back. And you can imagine that while he's walking back, he's reciting his speech that he's going to say to his dad to ask for forgiveness. Oh, father, you don't have to do this. But if you would be so kind, yada, yada, yada. And it says that the father sees him like way off in the distance, just a little glimpse of him which is pretty radical because it implies that the father was waiting for him, was waiting to catch a glimpse of him. He sees him way off in the distance and he just starts running towards him. He starts running to this estranged son of his. And you can imagine the son, you think your father's gonna be furious. You spat in his face, told him you wished he was dead, taken all of his money, wasted it all. He's never gonna get it back. You see the father running at him and you can imagine that he's just running to be like, Like, I don't know. That's probably what's going through my mind if I'm in that situation. Like, oh, I'm about to get tackled. I'm about to be, you know, yelled at, whatever the thing is. But to his shock and awe, he's wrapped in an embrace. He's given a robe, a clean, pristine robe, given the ring of sonship, put back on his finger. And this father announces, my son who is dead is alive. We must have a celebration. I must bring him back in. I must tell everyone how wildly pleased and delighted I am of this son who did nothing to deserve my welcome, but is receiving it. It doesn't get more clear than that, guys. We have been brought in with an unmerited, unparalleled generosity from God. And because of that, we have this spirit. We can have this spirit. Gratitude for what's been received, that is the undergirding heart posture of Christian hospitality, right? Gratitude for what has been given to us, that is the undergirding heart posture of Christian hospitality. And the second heart posture is this, I want to host Jesus. I want to host Jesus. As great as you all are, guess what? I want to host Jesus more than I want to host you. But I've received something really radical. I've been brought in, and therefore I'm willing to bring you in. And guess what? In our midst, I want to host Jesus. I want to host Jesus. It's so simple, yet we tend to overcomplicate it. Jesus's teachings are so clear in the gospel that what we do to others, we do to him. He says in Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to read it out. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and and all of the nations will be gathered together in his presence. And he'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. 
I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or when did we see you as a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? Jesus, you were in prison? What? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did this to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. These righteous ones inheriting the kingdom of God, they're doing it because they hosted Jesus through hosting the broken and the lowly. When we bring in the people who maybe we really love, maybe we get on really well with, when we bring in the people who maybe it doesn't make sense, it's not strategic, we aren't benefiting from it, when we're doing these random acts of generosity and hospitality, when we're hosting people well with our time, with our effort, when we're walking in this generous spirit towards others, guess what? Jesus says, you're doing it to me. The flip side of that is that when we are cold and cruel and we reject others, guess what? We're doing that to Jesus too. We want to host Jesus. And I love the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. I think it's just like the wildest, most fun story of these, these two unsuspecting guys who ended up hosting Jesus. This unplanned hospitality of a stranger. It's after Jesus resurrects and these two guys who followed Jesus, they're walking on a road to a place called Emmaus, and they somehow strike up this conversation with a man, and uh, the man basically says, like, hey, what's going on in Jerusalem? And they're like, are you the only guy in Jerusalem who hasn't heard? This guy who we thought was the Messiah, who we had all put all of our eggs into his basket. He was our hope. We were banking it on him. He got crucified. He's dead. Womp, womp, womp. And this guy's like, oh, that's crazy. The last I heard, the Messiah needed to suffer a lot in order to be raised into glory. Can I share with you how I know that? And it says that this man walks with these two disciples on this road, and he goes through the entire Old Testament, best Bible overview ever, from Moses all throughout the prophets, from, guess who? It's going to be Jesus. It's a surprise if you don't know this story. Um, with this man, he gives him this Bible overview about who the Messiah is and how he needed to suffer. And they reach Emmaus, and these disciples are like, all right, it's time to head in. I'm going to go and uh, go have dinner now. And Jesus is like, all right, I'm going to head on. And they're like, wait, no, you need to come with us. Like, this, it's dark. You know, these streets are dangerous. You still have a long journey to go. Come in, get some rest, get some nourishment, spend time with us. We want to host you. We don't know you. We didn't plan this, but let us host you. And they have this meal together. And it says that this man is in their midst and he breaks the bread and he blesses it. And it says, as he breaks the bread, their eyes are opened and they realize, this is Jesus. Oh my gosh, the resurrected Jesus is sitting in their midst and it's revealed over the broken bread of an unplanned dinner. And then all of a sudden, in his classic sneaky Jesus way, he just disappears. He's like, bah, <laughs> disappears. And, and the comment that they say to one another is, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scriptures to us? Did not our hearts burn within us? Did not our hearts burn within us? Judy, if you want to just start heading up, I, I have just one last sentence. These two heart postures, being brought in by God and being grateful for that, and the ultimate desire to host Jesus, these are the two heart postures which pave the way for good, true Christian biblical hospitality. And what if we began to host one another in a way where Jesus just turned up in our midst? And our hearts just began to burn. Amen? Can we just welcome up Judy? Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. Ooh, I, don't, I think we'd have to unscrew some stuff. If you put it right there, we can twist that up. 
that's good. Simon, Simon, Simon. That's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I didn't know he had given me that authority. That's great. Well, praise God. I'm going to hand over to Judy. love being here tonight. I just wanted to say, hi Lily, welcome home. <laughs> I just wanted to say something about uh, the spirit in this place. It is so deeply moving to see this spiritual renaissance that's happened at the Oval. And no matter your age, don't speak against it. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking to myself as well. I asked my friend John Peachy a few months ago, I said, John, what do you think caused this to happen? This whatever you want to call this. this how, I call it a renaissance. Yeah. And I loved his answer. Do you remember what it was, John? Mm-hmm. Grace of God. Yeah, sort of like that. But I, I like my answer even better than I think he said. <laughs> he, he said, I don't know. And I thought, that's the beauty of it. You know, you can't point to some technique or something. So it was so beautiful. Anyway, I always love being at the Oval. I don't always love being at some places, and that made me think about why do we carry emotional and spiritual memories of places? And I thought, I like coming here, and it's probably because when I came the first time a long time ago, I imagine I was met with a spirit of hospitality. And that has left an emotional and a spiritual memory, which we've all experienced, don't we, when we think about places that we've been. So my affection for the Oval can probably be traced back to that. Uh, To the new trainees that are here and guests, I trust that no matter how long you're here, you too will have spiritual and emotional memories that years from now are warm when you reflect on your journey. But also may you contribute to the memories of others while you're here during this time. Okay, hospitality is defined as openness and welcome to the stranger, the new person. But it is not only openness to the new person, but it's a pervading atmosphere of openness to new vision, new dreams that people are carrying, new ideas, new endeavors, and new innovations. And I like this definition. True hospitality has been described as love on the loose. (laughs) Okay, our oldest daughter is a food and lifestyle photographer. In fact, she's actually in Turkey right now on a photo assignment with uh, Kurdish, Turkish, and Syrian young women doing photography for their micro-businesses. Anyway, she lives in the Emerald City of the Pacific Northwest. And while her father was visiting her, she said, Dad, do you know what an underground restaurant is? And he said, no. And she said, would you like to go to one? And he goes, yeah. (laughs) Anyone here know what an underground restaurant is? Is Well, you would think, wouldn't you? So he envisioned, you know, a cough or a a wine cellar, really cozy with candlelights. No, that's not what an underground restaurant is. An underground restaurant usually involves an accomplished cook, such as a sous chef, who prepares a meal in a home or a private venue by word of mouth or discreet social media, if there is such a thing, the details regarding where and when the menu and the price are shared. Then those who have confirmed their attendance to this underground restaurant will receive the address for where they are together with others, mostly strangers around a table for a fine dining experience. And for Jim, he said, what an experience it was. It's a dining process of several courses and fine wines. It's not an eat and dash event. (laughs) It's about the preparation, the knowledge, the source of the food and wine, the environment, the lingering conversations, the host, and just as importantly, the strangers that are sitting around a table together. To sum it up, it's about what happens at the table. So my husband Jim once was visiting Mount Athos in the north of Greece. Anybody know what Mount Athos is or where it is? Very north of Greece. Northern Greece, it's on a peninsula 
And it's a peninsula where there are only monasteries there. And you have to apply for a visa to even enter Mount Athos. Usually it's just for a night. People come from all over the world, mostly hoping for some kind of spiritual experience while they're on Mount Athos. And just a bit of trivia, Mount Athos was known to be a favorite spiritual retreat of King Charles. Yeah. To visit Mount Athos, as I said, you must apply for a visa. There are various streams of orthodoxy that are resident in the monasteries. And then you are assigned where you will stay and which monastery you will stay in. Jim was assigned to stay in a monastery where the monks had taken a vow of silence, mostly around their evening meal. Imagine, if you can, an ancient venue, candlelight only, you and the robed monks sitting together, and the only sound at the table is that of utensils. Weird, huh? No one's speaking, and yet all of your other senses are awakened to awareness of who's sitting with you. We were once part of a YWAM ship ministry, and the guys that led the outreach department came up with this idea. They wanted to host what was called highways and byways dinners. So they came to the leadership and asked for permission because this was high-risk ministry as you can imagine. Taken from Luke 14, 21, where the master of the house says to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So the outreach team went out into the streets of whatever port of call that ship happened to be in. And remember, demographic support seaports are not middle upper class neighborhoods. And they invited the destitute, the needy, the broken, and yes, even the prostitutes. Now, you can easily envision, perhaps, the types of people that came to the highways and byways dinners on the YWAM ship. They arrived as they were, with only a printed dinner invitation as permission to board the ship, where they were then escorted as honored guests to a banquet meal. Jesus so understood the value of what happens around a table in physical and spiritual realities as well as a metaphor. In Psalm 23, David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's why I love you singing that song tonight. Who has time to eat when your enemies are chasing you? And yet in that tribal warring climate, a table was spread for David to come and feast on the goodness of God. We all know what happens around a table can be both wounding and life-giving. We all have emotional memories of tables. Those memories depend on the host and their motivations and those that were gathered around that table. Tonight, we are demonstrating, we are participating in a demonstration of the Father's table. He is our host, and his motivation is love. And the others that are gathered with us are our family in God. This date table disarms judgment, suspicion, polarization. This table is where we come face to face, spirit to spirit, with the other, where outdoing one another in love is the culture of the table. This is not a homogenous table. It is a table of rich diversity. Luke 13, 29, and people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places and recline at the feast in the kingdom of God. It is where we turn prejudice a prejudiced world around, one heart at a time. It is where the disregard and the disrespect for the other is non-existent. Around this table, we come out of ourselves. It's the first step in dismantling the barriers of the world. A past world leader had these sobering words to say that I've never forgotten. 
The world at every period of insecurity faces a new wave of tribalism. And our world right now is feeling very insecure. God's table of welcome dismantles tribalism. It's where we can physically reach out to one another. One of America's most renowned journalists is a man named David Brooks. He's with the New York Times. And David Brooks was interviewed by John Mark Comer, who some of you may know that name, who asked the question, David, how did you meet Jesus? And David Brooks responded like this, my friends invited me to dinner in their home. I was in the midst of a divorce, a lonely and dark season of my life. They invited me every Friday night to eat with their noisy kids and others that were included. It is at that table I saw and found grace every Friday night. I actually met grace before I met Jesus. So on this chilly autumn, October evening on the Oval that I love so much, I'm reminded of a Christmas hymn. <laughs> that was supposed to rattle your brain. You're, I'm thinking of Christmas on, in October. And this is the hymn I'm thinking of with our theme tonight. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. At this table, the soul, your soul and my soul and the soul of every human feels its worth. Connor's going to come and tell us how to share with one another. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 